أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين بنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Last week we began, or last month, we began the series on the months of the Islamic calendar. I mean, it's just did like an introduction to the series. We spoke about the uh, importance of the Islamic calendar. We spoke about how the Islamic calendar began in the time of Umar radiallahu an. And we mentioned how Umar radiallahu an, uh, during his leadership, there were certain incidents which took place, which made him realize the importance of having uh, an, an Islamic calendar that the Muslims could follow as opposed to following other calendars. Uh, it was important, relate, things related to uh, war, for example, messages arriving to the generals of the armies, and they would receive multiple letters and they wouldn't know which letter came first because there was no date on the letters, because there was no Islamic calendar. Agreements or uh, contracts that are written by uh, businessmen between one another and there was no concept of a dating system written on those uh, contracts so they could have a good idea of when those agreements lasted or when they began etc. And we also talked about the virtues and importance of the Islamic calendar and one of the virtues we mentioned was that it helps a person increase and improve his ibadah because you're able to recognize what months are coming, what days are coming, which are significant. Normally, we just know Ramadan and we know Dhul Hijjah because of Hajj. Otherwise, uh, it's hard for us to keep track of the virtues of uh, the different months of the Islamic calendar, virtuous days which may take place. And of course, this month is the first month of the Islamic calendar. And I think, inshallah, it will be beneficial because there are many virtues and benefits of this month itself. And this is, of course, the month of Muharram. And the month of Muharram, brothers and sisters, is the first month of the Islamic calendar. And in the past, the month of Muharram used to be called Safarul Awwal. So you have Muharram, and then the next month, the second month of the Islamic calendar, is called Safar. And in the past, they used to call it Safarul Awwal, the first Safar. And then Safarul Thani was Safar that we have today in the Islamic calendar. And why is it called Muharram? Why is Muharram given the name Muharram? Muharram is called Muharram because it's a sacred month. It's one of those months which has been given a title which is Al-Shahr Al-Haram or Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum. These sacred months. And there are four sacred months which are mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, this phrase is also in the Quran uh, and it's referring to specific months. Muharram is one of those months. And the word Muharram comes from the word Haram. <coughs> which means certain things are haram for a person to do in this month, as we'll get to, inshallah. And also, it's, uh, it's, it's something which symbolizes sacredness. The word haram, as we know, when we say masjid al-haram, it means a sacred masjid, meaning something which is known for its sanctity, it's showing the sanctity of the masjid. Likewise, when we talk about the month of Muharram, it's showing the sanctity of the month of Muharram, its virtue, its holiness, its sacredness. It's showing that certain things may not be forbidden, or may be forbidden in this month, unlike other months uh, of the Islamic calendar. Uh, and it's the first month of the Hijri calendar, as we mentioned. And why is it the first month? Who remembers? We did mention this last time. Anyone remember? A month ago? Four weeks ago? We said that Umar an was the one who decided to uh, have an Islamic calendar. And then he was discussing with the companions about which month would come first. And someone suggested that it should be the month of Muharram. Abbas Not Abbas radiallahu anhu. Osman radiallahu So Ali radiallahu uh, advised for the year to begin. Uh, for the year to begin at the Hijrah, that was Ali radiallahu anhu. Osman radiallahu uh, gave the advice to begin the year with the first month being the month of Muharram. He said, "Arrih al Muharram." He said, "Start the Islamic calendar with al Muharram." Because it's a sacred month. And it's the beginning of the year. And the people come back after performing Hajj. The idea being that a person comes back from Hajj, Allah has forgiven his sins, he's starting over a new leaf, he's a newborn baby, 
He has no sins. He's a new person. He's turning over a new leaf. He plans on, you know, improving himself as a Muslim. It's a new day, it's a new dawn, it's a new year for him. And so the intention is that he's going to be starting afresh and doing better than he used to in the previous days or in the previous months or years. And so the idea is that the month of Muharram is the first month after Hajj and a person is going to make that effort to try his best to worship Allah, to be more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the month of Muharram is also called the month of Allah. It's been associated with Allah Azza wa Jal. Shahrullah al-Muharram. In a hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the month of Allah, Muharram. And so it's a great month, it's a blessed month. And as I said, it's one of the sacred months, which Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentions in the Quran. Because he mentions, Ashhur al-Hurram. Allah says, inna iddata al-shuhur, in Surah Tawbah, inna iddata al-shuhur inda Allah ithna ashara shahran fi kitab Allah, yawm ba khalaqa samawati wal ard. Allah says, Verily, the number of months with Allah is 12 months, as it was ordained by Allah, يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The day in which He created the heavens and the earth. مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ From them are four which are sacred. مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ From them are four which are sacred. And the four which are sacred, from them is the month of Muharram. And then Allah says, ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمْ That is the right religion. فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ So don't wrong yourselves or oppress yourselves with regards to these months. Now what does it mean by don't oppress yourselves? Don't wrong yourselves? One could uh, say that this refers to the fact that a person should be careful in these months because they're so sacred, one should be careful not to commit sins. And also Ibn, uh, Ibn, Ibn Rajab, he says about this month, Muharram, he says it's a sacred month and it's a blessed month and uh, it's the most uh, holiest or the best month of the year after the month of Ramadan. And this is because there is a narration where Abu Dhal al-Ghifari, radiallahu anh, he asked the, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa he asked, O Messenger of Allah, uh, which, uh, uh, which mount is best? Which animal to ride is the best? And which layl which layl is the best, which night is the best, and which month is the best. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, the best mount you could have is the most expensive one, meaning the best quality one, that rides well. And he said, the best night is, the best part of the night is the last part of the night, before the dawn begins. And he said, Aftal al-ashhur, the best of months, shahrullah alladhi tad'oonahu muharram, is the month of Allah that you call muharram. And Ibn Rajab, when he talks about this hadith, he says, the intention meant behind this hadith is that it's the best month after the month of Ramadan. So when we ask, why aren't uh, the four months which are the sacred months, why isn't Ramadan one of those sacred months? Because Ramadan isn't one of those sacred months. Ramadan, of course, is a shahar which is Mubarak. It's a blessed month. It's a month in which Allah revealed the Qur'an. It's the greatest month of the year. But if you look at just the category of Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, the title given to these specific months, Ramadan isn't in there. That doesn't detract, of course, from the month of Ramadan and the status of the month of Ramadan and the blessing of Ramadan and Ramadan being the greatest month of the year. So other scholars, they say, when Allah says, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't oppress yourselves with regards to these months. At the end of the ayah that we mentioned, this, what does this mean? They said that sins during this time, sins during these months, these sacred months, they're worse than sins at other times of the year because of the sacredness of these months. Maharami, one of them. We'll get to the other months, inshallah, we'll talk about them. But the point is here that the, the months which are sacred, just like, for example, if a person was to commit sins while fasting in Ramadan, it's a greater thing in the sight of Allah. So likewise, a person who is in these holy months, these sacred months, a person should take more care not to commit sins, he should take more care to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this applies to all months. A person should always avoid committing sins. doesn't mean that you don't have to you know, uh, do good deeds in other months of the year. But the point being here, that these months have a special significance. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given certain days more importance, he's given certain nights more importance. Likewise, these months have been given uh, specific importance, just like Ramadan has also uh, its specific virtues. Ibn Abbas, عنه, he spoke about these, uh, uh, these issues, 
um, pertaining to this ayah and this phrase فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنْفُسَكُمْ What does it mean? And he said that the command to not wrong yourself applies to all months, applies to all months. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala singled out four months and made them sacred. And he emphasized their sanctity. And he made sin during these months more great, meaning worse. It's even more of a, uh, of a bigger deal. And he made righteous deeds and the reward in those months even bigger, even greater. Just like, for example, in the month of Ramadan. And Qatada, rahimahullah, he said, concerning this phrase, فَلَا تَظْرِمُوا فِيهِنَا أَنْفُسَكُمْ This part of the ayah. He said, wrongdoing during the sacred months is more serious and it incurs a greater burden of sin than in other months. And wrongdoing is a serious matter in any circumstance. In any circumstance, it's, it's something which is dangerous, it's something which is severe, it's something which is great. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes whatever He wills of His commands carry more weight. If Allah wills for something to be more rewardable on a specific day, on a specific month, then Allah can wish that. For example, one doesn't say, why is this month more rewardable? Why is that day more virtuous, more blessed? Why are good deeds worth more uh, in this specific month? It's just a, the blessing of Allah, the mercy of Allah. Allah has given certain months His blessings and certain months His virtues. And he said, Qatada, uh, he said, Allah has chosen elites from His creation. He has chosen elites from His creation. So for example, from the angels, He chose messengers. And from among uh, mankind, he chose messengers. From the, from the messengers of the angels is Jibreel And so, of course, the angels are a blessed creation, the creation of Allah. But from them, there are those who have higher status than others. Jibreel he once uh, was speaking to the Prophet and he said, Who do you regard to be the best of people amongst yourselves? And the Prophet he said, Those who participated at the Battle of Badr. And Jibreel salam. He replied and he said, likewise with the angels. The same thing with the angels. Those who participate in the Battle of Badr are considered higher in virtue. And so you have certain virtues that pertain to the creation of Allah, such as the angels, the messengers from the angels, uh, those messengers from mankind. Of course, they are of a higher virtue, the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From among those is... Uh, the person who remembers Allah, does dhikr of Allah, he has of course a higher status. Uh, from amongst spaces on earth, he chose the masajid. So the land up, uh, on earth is all the same. It's a blessed land for us. But of course, the masjid and the land upon where a masjid is built is uh, more sacred than other lands. And from among the months, he chose Ramadan as a sacred month. And from among the days of the week, of course, the day of Friday. And from amongst the nights, Laylatul Qadr. So, he said, venerate that which has been chosen by Allah. For people of understanding and wisdom, respect that which has been chosen by Allah. Meaning, give honor to whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored himself. And Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr an, he narrated that the Prophet he said, As-sana ithna ashra shahran. He said, the year is 12 months. Minha arba'atul hurum. From them are four which are sacred. Thalatha mutawaliyat. Three are consecutive months. So there are three months which are consecutive, three in a row, which are considered sacred. Dhul qa'da, dhul hijjah, and muharram. So these are the sacred months. And they're all in a row. Muharram being the first month. Dhul hijjah is the 12th month. Dhul qa'da is the month before dhul hijjah, 11th month. So the 11th month, 12th month, and the first month of the Islamic calendar, uh, Muharram is the first month. We're in the month of Muharram uh, to, uh, right now, at this moment in time. These three months, in a row, are from the sacred months. And then he said, وَرَجَبُ mudar," And Rajab of mudar, the month of Rajab. This month is also considered a sacred month. So these, these are the sacred months. Muharram, Rabi, uh, Muharram, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah. Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah and Muharram, and then the month of uh, Rajab is also considered to be one of the one of the sacred months. And he said, Rajab of Mudar, الذي بين جمادة وشعبان. Rajab of Mudar that comes between Jumada and Shaban. And so this hadith is in Bukhari, and he specifies what those sacred months are, what those al ashur al hurum are are actually, and what they refer to. And last month we did mention why they call al ashur al hurum. We said that from the reasons why, and this is even before Islam, 
before uh, Islam during the times of Jahiliyyah. In these specific months, for example, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram, uh, the tribes wouldn't fight each other. It was forbidden to fight. And they would use uh, these months to prepare for the month of Hajj, to prepare for Hajj itself. They would, uh, you know, uh, save money, they would prepare the, the animals, and they would travel uh, to Mecca to perform Hajj. And so these months were considered sacred. No fighting was allowed in these months. And this is something which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also legislated, meaning one cannot initiate uh, battles. Uh, the, the idea being that these months are sacred months, unless, of course, one is being attacked. Rajab is a separate month. Rajab, of course, doesn't follow the month of Muharram. Rajab is the seventh month of the Islamic calendar. So why is Rajab considered a sacred month? Because of Umrah. Some of the scholars, they say, from the wisdoms is, because of Umrah, a person can go halfway during the year and he can perform Umrah in the sacred month of Rajab and he will be safe, no harm will come to him, uh, there won't be any uh, battles taking place, and so he can perform uh, Umrah during the month of Rajab and it will be considered uh, a sacred month. And there are virtues of the month of Muharram that we can go through. From them is the virtue of fasting, just generally. These are general virtues of the month of Muharram. Abu Hurairah he said that the Prophet said, Afdalu Siyam, the best Siyam, the best fast, Ba'da Siyam Shahr Ramadan, after the fast of the month of Ramadan, Shahrullah al Muharram, is the month of Allah Muharram. And again, this hadith, as we said before, the Prophet calls Muharram Shahrullah. He associates the month with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And this, again, shows us the sanctity and the holiness and the status of the month of Muharram. Why is it called Shahrullah? Why specifically the month of Muharram? <clears throat> the phrase Shahrullah is indicative of the veneration of this month by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because it's attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the intention is that Allah intends for this month to be raised in status compared to other months. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specifically given this month, uh, this name, Shahrullah, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa would say. Why does the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would fast more in Sha'ban than in any other month if the month of Allah Muharram is the greatest month to fast after the month of Ramadan? The hadith of Aisha mentions, I never saw anyone fast more I never saw the Prophet ﷺ fast more in any month than the month of Sha'ban. There's a hadith that mentions this. But we just mentioned that the greatest month to fast is the month of Muharram. The Prophet ﷺ used to fast a great deal during Sha'ban. He would fast a lot during the month of Sha'ban. And perhaps the virtue of the month of Muharram wasn't revealed to him until the end of his life, towards the end of his life, before he was able to fast during this month. And from the evidences we have of this is the fact that uh, the Prophet ﷺ had a conversation with the Jews who used to fast on the 10th of Muharram. And he would ask them, why do you fast on this, uh, in this month? And it's something we'll mention later. And they would say this was the day Musa ﷺ was saved. And he said this is uh, something which we have more right to. We have more right to Musa than you do. So we're going to fast on this day and we're going to fast another day. So it does seem like this was something which was initiated uh, later on in, and incorporated into the Sharia <coughs> later on and maybe this was the reason why Aisha radiallahu anhu Aisha radiallahu anha specifies the month of Sha'ban uh, so the month of Muharram this month we're in the virtues of this month is that a person should fast you should fast a lot in this month can a person fast the whole of the month of Muharram can a person if he wishes to because of the virtue of fasting in this month fast the whole month the Prophet <coughs> never fasted any month in full except for, of course, the month of Ramadan. He wouldn't fast any month uh, in its entirety except the month of Ramadan. <laughs> so when we say that the greatest month to fast is the month of Muharram after Ramadan, it's meant to be understood as a means to be encouraged <coughs> to fast in the month of Muharram. It's supposed to encourage us to fast a great deal during the month of Muharram. Not to fast the entire month, but to fast as much as we can. <clears throat> we know, for example, Friday is going to be the 10th of Muharram. And the day before and the day after are also days which are recommended for a person to fast. And so, a person can fast those days, as we'll mention, and other days as well. 
did the Prophet ﷺ fast Muharram Mo or Sha'ban Mo? There are no reports, as we said before, of the Prophet ﷺ fasting more in the month of Muharram. But like we said, maybe that's because it was something which was uh, implemented uh, later on. And of course, we know about the hadith of Aisha concerning the month of Sha'ban, which is the month before the month of Ramadan. There are other things that the scholars mention and they talk about. They say, is it better uh, to fast in the month of Muharram uh, than fasting the six days of Shawwal or the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Arafah, for example? And they say Muharram is more virtuous, generally speaking. Muharram, generally speaking, as a month, is more virtuous than those specific days uh, or those specific months. <coughs> so if you talk about specific months, Muharram as a month in terms of its virtue and fasting in this month, it's more virtuous to fast in the month of, uh, month of Muharram than it is to fast in the month of Dhul Hijjah or the month of Shawwal, generally speaking. However, when we talk about specific days, and other days may be better. For example, the ninth of the Hijjah, uh, the ninth of the Hijjah, which is the greatest month, uh, the greatest day of the year. And so, of course, specific days may be better, but as a month, generally speaking, the virtues of the month of Muharram might be greater. In the Rajab, Rahimahullah, he also speaks about the virtue of night prayer. In the Rajab, he wrote a book uh, talking about the months of the Islamic year. And he talks about the month of Muharram, in the chapter about the month of Muharram, <coughs> he mentions the hadith of the night prayer. And he mentions the hadith when he's talking about the month of Muharram. And he mentions the hadith when the Prophet said, yes. After the siyam, after the shahr of Ramadan, shahr of Muharram. The best and most virtuous of months after the month of Ramadan is the month of Allah Muharram. Wa after the salah. He continues the hadith, the hadith continues. And the best and most virtuous salah, بعد الفريضة, after the obligatory prayers, Salatul Layl are the prayers of the night. <coughs> so it's the same hadith. And he mentions it in the month of Muharram, the hadith, in his book. Why? To show us the uh, virtues and importance and the uh, association of the night prayer to the month of Muharram. And so praying the night prayer is something which is also encouraged in the month of Muharram because of this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he mentions the night prayer after talking about the, ver the most virtuous month after the month of Ramadan with regards to fasting is the month of Muharram. And so Ibn Rajab connects the two. And he said that a person should also be encouraged to uh, pray uh, the Hajjid prayer, the night prayer uh, in the month of Muharram also. Now of course we know about the virtues of the 10th of Muharram. And the 10th of Muharram is called Ashura. And Ashura comes from the number 10. Ashura. They call it Ashura. And Ashura is a day in which it is encouraged for uh, Muslims to fast. And there were different stages in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed uh, the month of uh, the 10th of Muharram uh, for people to fast. First, the Quraysh, interestingly, they would also fast on this day in Mecca. And we know that the Quraysh, they would have, this is before Islam, we know that they would have certain habits and traditions that came down from Ibrahim a.s. And so this may have been one of those traditions that came down, uh, that was just passed down, and they had this habit of fasting on the 9th uh, of the Hijjah. And initially, the 10th of Muharram was something which was compulsory. It was something which was made compulsory by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After... Later on, it became something which was recommended. Uh, when was it made recommended? After Ramadan had become obligatory upon the Muslims. When the Ramadan became obligatory upon the Muslims, uh, the 9th of, or the 10th of Muharram became something which was uh, a sunnah, something which was recommended for a Muslim to do. The second stage of uh, the month of, uh, the 10th of uh, Muharram being uh, a day in which a person should fast, is when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina. And we mentioned the incident briefly. He asked the Jews why they fasted. Uh, the Prophet is, uh, is mentioned in the hadith, قادم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم المدينة That the Prophet ﷺ, he came to Medina, فرأى اليهود تصوم يوم عشورة And he saw the, the Jews fasting on the day of Ashura. فقال ما هذا? And so he said, what is it? This hadith Bukhari. He said, what is this? They said, هذا يوم صالح. They said, this is a great day, this is an amazing day. 
هذا يوم نجى الله بني إسرائيل من عدوهم فصامه موسى. This is the day. It's a great day. This is the day upon which Allah subhanahu wa taala saved Bani Israel. These are the Jews speaking about Bani Israel. This is the this is their people. This is their race. They said this is the day Allah subhanahu wa taala saved Bani Israel من عدوهم from the enemy, meaning Pharaoh and his army. فصامه موسى. So موسى fasted on this day as a show of thanks and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa heard this, he said, فَنَحْنُ أَحَقُّ وَأَوْلَى بِمُوسَى مِنْكُمْ We have more right over Musa than you do. We have more right and we are, we are more priority uh, over Musa than you do. Why? Because our worship is the same as the worship of Musa alayhi salam. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa worshipped Allah. Musa was uh, a believer in Allah, he was a Muslim, he submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are also considered to be Muslims. And so he said, we have more right to Musa than you do. We are closer in terms of our worship to Allah, the, uh, our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than you. And so the hadith says, فَصَامَهُ وَأَمْرَ بِصِيَامِهِ So he fasted it and he commanded others to also fast it. And so this is where the virtue of fasting on the 10th of Muharram is something uh, which has its uh, status and has its importance because of this hadith of the Prophet The third stage of the month, uh, the 10th of the month of Muharram being a virtuous day to fast is that the Prophet said in a hadith, فَإِذَا كَانَ الْعَامَ الْمُقْبِلِ When next year comes, صُمْنَ الْيَوْمُ التَّاسِعِ We will fast we will fast the ninth day also. He said when the next year comes, next year, when next year comes, inshallah, we're going to also fast the ninth day. We're going to fast the ninth and we're going to fast uh, the tenth. So the hadith mentions in this hadith Muslim, <laughs> that the following year never came except that the Prophet ﷺ had already passed away. So this is the tenth of the Hijri calendar. So the following year, uh, Muharram comes, and or the eleventh year, Muharram comes, and of course the Prophet ﷺ has passed away, and now the Sunnah remains that a person is encouraged to fast and uh, the tenth, just to differ from the people of the book, just to differ from the Jews, because they of course specify the tenth of Muharram to fast, and so we will pick the ninth. And of course, the scholars, they say, a person is permissible for him to fast the 11th and the 10th also in order to differ from uh, the people of the book. Ibn Abbas, عنهما, he said, رأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يتحرى I, I never saw uh, ما رأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يتحرى uh, صيام يوم فضله على غيره إلا هذا اليوم I never saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم singling out any any day's fast and considering it more excellent than any other except this day, meaning the day of Ashura. I never saw the Prophet ﷺ single out any day's fast and considering it more excellent than another except this day, the day of Ashura. So this really shows us the status of fasting on the day of Ashura. وَهَذَا الشَّهَرْ يَعْنِي هَذَا الشَّهَرْ رَمَضَانِ And with regards to months, the month of Ramadan. So with regards to days, I never saw him uh, show more uh, concern and singling out to any day more than the 10th of Muharram. And I never saw him singling out any month for fasting except for the day of, uh, the month of Ramadan. More than any other months, the month of Ramadan. And with regards to the virtues of fasting on the 10th of Muharram, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, يُكَفِّرُ صِلَةُ الْمَعْضِيَةِ that it wipes out, erases the sins of the previous year. When he was asked uh, the benefits of fasting the 10th of Muharram, he said it's an expiation for the sins for the sins of the preceding year, of the previous year. And that's the reward. One day's worth of fasting, brothers and sisters, if it's done correctly with the correct intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the sins of the whole year. And look at this really shows us the mercy of Allah, Allah's kindness, just from one day's act, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes our sins. And this shows us the mercy of Allah. Allah says Allah doesn't want to be an, uh, want to cause oppression upon his slaves. 
upon the slaves. He wants to show mercy, he wants to show forgiveness, he wants to forgive. We just have to make uh, that small effort to earn the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another narration mentions, in كُنْتَ صَائِمًا شَهْرًا بَعْدَ رَمَضَانِ فَالصُّمُّ الْمُحَرَّمُ if you were to fast another month after Ramadan, then fast in the month of Muharram. فَإِنَّ فِيهِ يَوْمًا تَابَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ وَيَتُوبُ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ آخَرِينَ Because verily, uh, there is a day in that month, تَابَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ Allah uh, accepted the repentance and forgave a nation. وَيَتُوبُ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ آخَرِينَ And He will forgive another nation on this specific day, in this specific month. Uh, in the month of Muharram. And so, again, it shows the value and the virtues of seeking Allah's forgiveness in this blessed month which we are in now, the month of Muharram, and fasting, praying, and just generally doing good deeds. One of the significant events of this month, and this is what we're going to be concluding with, inshallah, there are a number of uh, significant events. From the greatest significant events is the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu anh, the grandson of the Prophet وسلم, in the 61st year of the Hijrah, in this in the month in the month of Muharram on the day of Ashura. That's why sometimes people get confused. They say we're supposed to fast tenth of Muharram because you know the Shias they do other things and what's going on and what we, what do we do what do we what don't we do what's right what's wrong etc. So uh, the Shias they have their own. Uh, reasons why they single out the 10th of Muharram. And they have their own uh, reasons. From the reasons is, of course, the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu anh. Hussein was assassinated and they remember this day to mourn this day, to mourn the death of Hussein radiallahu anh. Uh, you may have seen, for example, they might beat their, uh, their chests or they slap their cheeks or they strike their shoulders. Uh, in some places, they strike their shoulders and their backs with chains, with blades. Um, you know, the more extreme from amongst them, I wouldn't say all of them, uh, but they, some of them did, they do uh, do these types of things to try to share in the pain of what happened to Hussein radiallahu anh on that day in Karbala when he was uh, assassinated. And it's a very long story. The basic principle is that Muawiyah radiallahu anh, when he died, he had already appointed his son Yazid to be the leader. And Yazid wasn't a companion. And he wasn't the best Muslim. It said that he was involved in certain sins. And many of the companions... Uh, weren't happy with this decision because the idea should be that whoever uh, is chosen isn't chosen because of being from a specific family but he's chosen because he's the best leader. Muawiyah his reasoning was if I choose my son then there won't be any bloodshed. I'll choose him before I even die. So that when I do die there's no issue, there's no civil war again just like there was when I was alive between me and Ali radiallahu anh. When I die, Yazid will be the leader and there won't be any issues. Things will continue as normal. There won't be another civil war. Otherwise, there's always going to be a civil war taking place and people fighting. That was his reasoning. And of course, they're all companions. They all have their reasoning. The point being, some refused to pledge allegiance. And from them was Hussein radiallahu anh. The other was Abdullah ibn Zubair, who of course was also uh, killed and assassinated uh, later on. But Hussein radiallahu anh, uh, didn't pledge allegiance and of course many of the, of the people at the time were looking towards these companions because now they're the senior companions who are left and Hussein radiallahu anh found support in Kufa and as he was making his way to Kufa he realized that the people he had sent to Kufa to investigate and see if he had enough support there for people who would support him if he was to stand against, uh, against Yazid, against the ruler uh, those people had been killed already by Yazid's men and so now he was in a position where he had already left Medina, but he couldn't go to Kufa because there was nobody there who was going to support him now. It was almost like they had backed down after what had happened to the supporters of uh, Hussein radiallahu anh, his own uh, cousin, for example, Muslim ibn Aqeel, Aqeel ibn Abi Talib, who was Ali ibn Abi Talib's brother. And so Aqeel ibn Abi Talib had a son called Muslim, Hussein's cousin, who he sent to Kufa. And so uh, Aqeel was, uh, Muslim ibn Aqeel was assassinated. Basically, to cut a story short, he was in Karbala and an army was sent by Yazid. And Yazid told the general, do whatever you can, do whatever you need to do to make sure Hussein doesn't go to Kufa. And the general assumed anything's, anything's, everything's a go, I've been given free reign to do whatever I want. And so he uh, killed most of the men, or in fact all of the men from the 
the, the contingent of the party of Hussein radiallahu anh, and they weren't a huge group, they were about 30 or 40 or 50 or so and obviously the army was you know, a few thousand and so they were assassinated, there were, the women were left and the children were left but Hussein of course was assassinated. Uh, some narrations mentioned that the head was taken to Yazid, that's something which uh, we don't know but it is mentioned that the general who was responsible, he was also killed later on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed this individual because he was also killed, his head was cut off, he was beheaded and the Rishis mentioned this man, this general, snakes came out of his head when his head was cut off as a punishment because of what he did to Hussein The lesson being uh, from the Sunni perspective is that of course this day is a sad day. It's a day which we're not going to be celebrating and thinking, yes, this is a good thing. Of course, this is the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. And we feel the pain of, you know, those who feel the pain of uh, the grandson of the Prophet of, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being assassinated in this manner and being killed. It's a sad uh, uh, incident. It's a sad moment in our history. However, to apply something to Islam and to uh, add something to Islam after the death of the Prophet ﷺ is something which is, is haram. It's not permissible. So anything we do uh, from, this, from the uh, perspective of obedience and worship of Allah has to come from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, you can't introduce anything into Islam and say this is the reason why we do this, because of this thing which happened after the Prophet's death. This makes sense. Because you're saying other things happened after the Prophet's death, which are part of Islam, but then that defeats the purpose of the Prophet ﷺ coming. Because his whole point was to bring this Islam to everybody. And as Allah says, Today I have completed for you your religion. So it doesn't make sense that we would incorporate this into Islam and say it's part of Islam. It's a, it's a moment in Islamic history. It's a sad day. It's something which, of course, uh, you know, it's something which we, uh, we feel. We feel the sadness. We feel the, you know, the, uh, the, the sadness of that day. It's an emotional thing to, 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 to have to hear and, and uh, read about the story of how Hussein radiallahu an, was assassinated and killed. But the point being, we don't associate that with the month of Muharram and Ashura and the act of fasting itself. Because, of course, this was something which was a coincidence. It was Allah's qadr, Allah's decree, that he would be killed on this specific day. But fasting and the reward of fasting is why uh, we do it with regards to the month of Muharram and the 10th of the month of Muharram. What other events took place on uh, Muharram, in the month of Muharram? There was uh, something which people did in Syria many, many years ago. And they would do the opposite of what the Shias would do. So after this incident, you had the, some people from Sham called the Nausibis. You had the Rafidis who would basically remember this day and be sad of this day. They would cry and they would weep and they would, you know, wail and they would, uh, you know, show their sadness. You had the Nausibis who would do the opposite. So for every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. You always notice that. There's always two extremes. So what they would do is they would have a party on this day, the tenth of Muharram, because for them, their perspective is the death of Hussein has nothing to do with. Ashura and fasting, but they would go the other extreme. And so they would cook uh, food on this day, they would perform ghusl on the day of Ashura, they would perfume themselves, they would wear the finest clothes, just to counter what the, what the Rafidah were doing, to counter what the Shias were doing. They would do the complete opposite. And of course, neither of these things are from the Sunnah. The Sunnah is, isn't to you know, perform ghusl and to, unless it's the day of Friday, obviously, otherwise, you know, generally speaking, on the 10th of Muharram, there's nothing mentioned with regards to performing ghusl or having special food or perfuming, perfuming oneself more than maybe he would normally or wearing nice clothes. The Sunnah is simply to fast and to increase in one's uh, ibadah on that day while he's fasting. And even Taymiyyah, he says something interesting. He says, some introduced mourning and other things, while others introduced celebrations. So they regarded the day of Ashura as a day for wearing kuhal, performing ghusl, spending time with the family, making special foods. And he said every innovation is going astray. None of the four imams of the Muslims or any other scholars regarded either of these things as mustahab, as encouraged. Meaning neither mourning and wailing and feeling sad on this day, but also 
happy and having a party and you know wearing nice clothes, etc. Neither of these things are things which were recommended by the four Imams. What is recommended, of course, is uh, to fast. Also, from the hadith that we, we mentioned, from the things which happened in the month of Muharram, is that Musa السلام, was saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know on the day of Arab, because when the Prophet had from the Jews, he never refuted them. So we know that on this day, the 10th of uh, Muharram, uh, Musa السلام, was also saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also in the month of Muharram, in the sixth year of the Hijrah, the Prophet وسلم, married Safiya bint Huyay. The sixth year of the Hijrah, the Prophet وسلم, married Safiya bint Huyay uh, in this month, in the month of Muharram. In the seventh Hijrah, in this month, the month of Muharram, the Prophet وسلم, left for Khaybar. The expedition to Khaybar took place in the seventh year of the Hijrah, in the month of Muharram. And the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, in the 14th year of the Hijrah, passed away. 14, 14 Hijri, in the month of Muharram, the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, also passed away. And lastly, in the 16th year of the Hijrah, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu Maria, the mother of Ibrahim, the Prophet's son, uh, she passes away. 16th year of the Hijrah, six years after uh, the Prophet ﷺ's death, Maria uh, anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, also passes away. And finally, of course, Muharram uh, is the month we're in today, uh, this month, and the 10th of Muharram, I believe, is on Friday. It's on Friday, inshallah. And, of course, uh, because it's the 10th of Muharram, there's no harm in fasting on Friday. Normally, it's not encouraged or recommended for a person to fast on a Friday unless he's fasting the day before or the day after. In this case, because of the virtue of the 10th of Muharram, it just so happens to be on the Friday. So there's nothing wrong with a person fasting on the Friday, not because it's Friday, but because it's the 10th of Muharram. And of course, if a person fasts the 9th and the 10th, or the 10th and the 11th, then of course that's better because this was the intention of the Prophet ﷺ and to be different, and to be different from uh, the people of the book. If a person wants to fast the 9th, 10th and 11th, that's even better because it's three days instead of two days. Nothing wrong with that either. The scholars they say that's also fine because you know you're increasing in good deeds in the month of Muharram. The month of Muharram is the best month for fasting as we mentioned already. So there's nothing wrong with a person fasting all three days if he wishes to do so inshallah. And uh, with this we'll conclude. If there's any questions, then I'll uh, answer any questions you may have. You know, we get this this um, common practice amongst Muslims nowadays, you know, where they celebrate the New Year, they say Muharram, Mubarak, and things like that. And are we supposed to do things like that? Are we supposed to engage in celebrating the New Year, Muharram, and things like that? So there's no uh, evidence to, to suggest that a person should say Muharram Mubarak or you know, uh, Happy New Year or sing things similar to this when it comes to the Islamic calendar. Uh, what is permissible is for a person to reflect on the previous year which has gone by, to reflect on the new year and how he's going to improve himself. What non-Muslims may call you know, New Year's resolutions for example. There's no religious connotation attached to New Year's resolutions. It's just what people want to do to improve themselves. As Muslims, it's even more of a priority for us every single day to try to improve ourselves. So when the New Year comes, it's even more appropriate for us to think about how we're going to improve, how we're going to better ourselves. So for a person to continue to improve, to do better, uh, to you know increase in ibadah, to think about how he's going to increase in good deeds in the New Year, nothing wrong with that. But with regards to congratulating one another with regards to the New Year, I haven't come across anything specific, Allah knows best. Uh, I've got one question. Uh, you know, the Yazid, when he was appointed uh, as a ruler by uh, Muawiyah Rizalat al so was he Fasik at that time? Or he became Fasik later on? I'm not sure. Because he wasn't young when he became the leader. I'm not sure how old he was. But it said that he wasn't somebody who was completely righteous. Okay. So... So, maybe before and maybe after as well, Allah's best. Okay, so did he accept, you know, Hussein Rizillah? Did he accept him as a leader at first? Muawiyah. No, Hussein Rizillah. Did Muawiyah accept Hussein as a leader? No, no. Did, did Hussein accept Muawiyah as a leader? Sorry, Yazid as a leader. Sorry, did Hussein accept Yazid as a leader? Yeah, no. When? no. From start at all? No. Okay. All the companions eventually did give the Pledge of Allegiance. Like I believe Ibn Umar, uh, others. They eventually did. 
But uh, Hussein radiallahu anh never did. And he went to, to Kufa, and he tried to go to Kufa because there was rumors of support there for him if he stood up against Yazid. And companions even tried to persuade him not to go. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma tried to persuade him not to go. And he was, the narrations mentioned he was even crying, trying to stop Hussein from going, <laughs> trying to go against the leader. But Hussein radiallahu anhu didn't listen. Yeah. Is it Imam Hussein and Hassan? Isn't it two or one? There's two. Has, Hassan has passed away at this moment in time. Yeah, Hassan passed away. Gone, yeah. Kufa. yeah, Hassan passed away. Hassan was the leader for six months. Before going to Kufa. Uh, yeah, this is before Kufa. Uh, Hassan radiallahu an, after Ali radiallahu an was assassinated, mm-hmm. Hassan became the leader for six months. Uh-huh. And Muawiyah claimed he was a leader at the same time. Uh-huh. And so Hassan eventually realized that I'll, if I continue to claim to be the leader, Muawiyah is not going to step down either. We're going to carry on having... Mm-hmm. Civil war and fighting. So Hassan radiallahu anh stepped down. This is, this is actually what the Prophet said. He said about Hassan, in Nabi hadha Sayyid, that this son of mine is going to be a leader and he's going to reconcile between two Muslim groups. And this happened because Hassan reconciled between two Muslim groups to stop them from fighting by stepping down. So he showed true leadership by stepping down after six months because he never wanted war, he had concern for the Ummah, he stepped down. He said, Ma'ala, you can be the leader. This was Hassan. Mm-hmm. And then a few uh, a few months later, he was he was oh, some say he was assassinated, some say he, he died, some say he was poisoned. He said uh, he didn't order uh, the Yazid didn't order the killing of the Hussein and then he was not happy about the yeah. the killing of uh, his, and then even the his head uh, didn't uh, transfer to. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what, yeah, do you so make of, what do you make of then? Then the second, when uh, um, uh, Hussein Radhanu decided to immigrate to leave uh, Medina Manawara, and Zubair bin Amr al Samur Sahaba to, told him, don't go uh, mm-hmm. to uh, Kofa because that pe- those people, they already did <laughs> wrong with your father, mm-hmm. with Ali Radhanu. So, uh, in this regard, this is just one of my teacher, the history teacher, he said, uh, uh, you know, Yazid, uh, he was not uh, absolutely not a respectful person, however, but uh, he he was not involved in his uh, yeah. killing. Mm-hmm. That was uh, that Munafiqeen, which nowadays they celebrate or they mourn uh, his killing. So, yeah, we, fact, mentioned, yeah, we mentioned that. that. Yeah, we said Yazid, Yazid uh, with regards to whether or not his instructions were do what you can to stop Hussein. So, some say that meant. Do whatever you mean, do whatever you can, meaning, even if it means mm-hmm. killing Hussein. Mm-hmm. Others they say no, he never explicitly said kill Hussein. And that's why, as you said, there are narrations which mention Yazid was upset, he was angry when uh, he found out that uh, uh, Hussein had been assassinated. Mm-hmm. But uh, then the argument is, one may also say he never did anything to the to the general. Mm-hmm. Why he left Medina, sir? Because there was some more uh, Sahaba, and they said they will. Uh, Support him. Don't go from here. We are here. We will. Uh, no, it's about the general who eventually killed Hussein. No, no. I said why he he left Medina. Hussein. Oh, yeah. Well, he because he wanted to leave Medina because he knew eventually the Yazid would send his army to Medina because in those days they would pledge allegiance by sending somebody to represent Yazid, and so they would come and they would hand in hand pledge allegiance from the companions, and of course he's famous, and so they want to see people are watching to see is he going to pledge allegiance to Yazid or not. And so then that's why he didn't want to have to be in that position. He didn't want to f- to be uh, fighting in Medina. And that's why. I'm not the best. Yeah, maybe. Mm. maybe. So from the Islamic perspective, is a Muslim allowed to say a prayer of Yazid? Is he is a Muslim allowed to say a prayer thing to Yazid? Mm-hmm. No, we just be general. We just be general. Uh, even the scholars of the past. Uh, they were asked, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal was asked something about Yazid and he was asked, uh, was he a righteous person? And he said, who amongst the scholars and amongst the people said that he's a righteous person? Or something to this effect. So it was understood that Yazid wasn't somebody who was known to be a righteous person. We don't go you know, into details and mm-hmm. talk about him from, you know, talk about his, you know, his, 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 you know, the details of his life and exactly what he did. We just have to give a general understanding general idea of who he was 
He wasn't a companion. He wasn't somebody who was known to be the most righteous of people. Mm -hmm. And inshallah, it's understood. I think it's understood the kind of you know, thing that we're talking about. Okay, inshallah, Zakhmullah, Subhanahu Allah, Alhamdulillah, Ashhadu Allah, Ilaha Illa Anta, Zakhmullah, Wa Tawbah.